Welcome back to the show. Joining me this week for the first time is founder of River, Alex Leishman. It's great to see you, Alex. I'm a customer, a very happy one. So thanks for, for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me on. I want to learn a little bit more about your background. And full disclosure, about a year ago, I created my River account. I was referred by the one and only Preston Pish. Um, I've really been happy with the fact that the fees are super low. And then when you do a recurring buy, there are no fees at all. You guys have some really cool products coming out. Um, proof of reserves you recently activated. And we're, we'll talk about the interest um, update that you have. You can earn interest on the dollars that you have on River, but in Bitcoin, I believe. Uh, so Alex, first, just tell me, how did you get to create this company? Yeah. So long story short, I built my uh, the early part of my career around Bitcoin. I was a software engineer in the Bay Area and <clears throat> was mostly focused on uh, in, in the Bitcoin space. Um, I ended up going back to grad school and studied computer science at Stanford, where I helped teach the first Bitcoin class there. And then uh, found myself eventually at a, at a fund that invested in um, a lot of companies in the ecosystem and realized that there was a big gap in the market uh, to build a company focused only on Bitcoin because a lot of the historic, a lot of the existing uh, crypto exchanges at that point, and this was about 2018, 2019, had built big businesses, but they were all really focused on gambling and speculation and this long tail of crypto assets that I just felt wasn't really in kind of fulfilling the vision and the potential that Bitcoin actually had for the world. And so I said, well, what? What if I started a big, what, what would a company like Coinbase look like if it had focused only on Bitcoin and bringing that to the world? And that's the general vision behind River is um, building a financial institution focused on helping people and businesses save in Bitcoin uh, and obsessing about that goal and obsessing about bringing Bitcoin to the world. Can you talk a little bit more about that decision to be Bitcoin only? Because um, I think a lot of people don't realize that it does come at a sacrifice. If you're one of these crypto casinos, you do essentially earn more revenue with all the trading fees on the altcoins, right? So you decided to kind of be the the, the tortoise that's going to win the race and you're going to build slow and steady and you have that engineering background. You put a lot of effort into actually making sure that the custody is um, completely airtight. So talk to me about those decisions and why they were important to you. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a few reasons there. So one is about brand and trust. Um, I always felt that <clears throat> all of these crypto assets wouldn't play out very well financially for customers and that largely it was Silicon Valley insiders dumping on retail investors. Now, if you build a business around that, you can make money in the short term facilitating that. But long term, that's actually not a great business um, because people will get wise to it. And um, so it's economically rational to think, well, yes, you know, if I offered a crypto casino today, I'd make a lot of money, mm -hmm. but um, at, at, at a cost to my brand and, and trust. Whereas if I want to truly build a real financial institution, it's all about trust in the brand. And um, if I'm offering a, bu a bunch of products I don't believe in, then I'm not going to have a trusted brand. Additionally, by focusing only on Bitcoin, uh, our systems, our business, everything is much simpler. So we can move a lot faster and build a lot cooler features. Uh, because we're focused on Bitcoin singularly, and these are features that would take, you know, many, many years for, for a company like Coinbase to build, proof of reserves being a perfect example. Coin Stories is proudly brought to you by BitDare, a global leader in disruptive technology for Bitcoin mining and AI. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer boasts a massive 2.5 gigawatts of electrical capacity and infrastructure under development across three continents, positioning BitDeer as one of the most diversified and power-dense computing companies in the world. BitDeer's leadership pioneered the original advancements in Bitcoin mining ASICs and is now poised to disrupt the market again with groundbreaking new designs for the next generation of mining ASICs that are targeted to reach efficiencies of as low as 5 joules per terahash by late next year. 
Now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about that. But first, I wanted to ask you just about um, when someone logs onto their account, they create one of these um, you know, exchange accounts and they're ready to buy Bitcoin. How do you get the pricing that you see? And like, what's the difference between over the counter? Um, how are, where, where are you getting the Bitcoin? And then why are there different prices essentially depending on the exchange? And sometimes what I found, and I'm going to call out Coinbase for this, you like see the price of Bitcoin and then you go to the buy page and it's like, a, it could be like a thousand dollars more or the fees are outrageous. And I'm like, wait, I just saw a lower price. So what's happening behind the scenes? Yeah, so Bitcoin is a little bit different than stocks um, because Bitcoin actually trades in a lot of different places, whereas most stocks trade on one single exchange for the most part. And so with stocks, there's more or less a, a pretty sort of unified price for that asset. Whereas with Bitcoin, there's lots of different places Bitcoin is being traded, which means there's different prices. And so that's that could that that's part of what contributes to seeing different prices across different places. Now that said. Um, what what uh, Coinbase is doing when you when you see that when you know you see a price on their page and then you go to buy Bitcoin and it's much higher. Coinbase actually has a very big spread, is what it's called. And so um, the mid market price of Bitcoin, sort of the the last price Bitcoin traded at, is um, a different concept than the price that Coinbase is selling you the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Coinbase is typically adding um, a percent or more uh, to to the actual price of Bitcoin before they start charging you fees. Um, now, everyone has some spread. Um, ours is much, much lower than Coinbase. Coinbase's is a pretty hidden, very big spread. And yeah. we're getting the Bitcoin from uh, a lot of different trading desks around the country, very trusted trading desks that are kind of, you can see view it as almost bulk sellers of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that's the OTC? Correct. Yes. Got it. So interesting. Um, so talk to us about proof of reserves. Uh, I feel like a lot of companies are going to move in this direction. And really, it goes to the heart of what Bitcoin is all about, which is transparency, right? Absolutely. So you know, our vision is to build the most trusted financial institution in the world. And uh, proof of reserves was a big step towards that. And it's something that Bitcoin is uniquely able to allow financial institutions to do. And what it is effectively is it proves to customers that um, the money we say we have is actually there in the vault. Uh, so in contrast to a bank where you put a dollar in the bank and maybe they're only keeping 10% of it around, uh, if you have a Bitcoin in your account at River, there's one Bitcoin in the vault, in our cold storage is what we call it. Now, that's always been the case. However, with proof of reserves, what we do is we prove it to you now. Um, mm. There have been there have been examples where people said this is what they were doing, but it's not what they were doing, mm -hmm. and they were lying, and they were actually insolvent. And so the way proof of reserves works is we prove to you that the assets, the Bitcoin we have in the vault, is equal to the liabilities or the you know the account balances uh, that represent the Bitcoin we owe our our clients. And um, this, what this does is it, it reveals also how much Bitcoin is under custody at River, and uh, it brings a lot of transparency to the business. Mm. So you are building, continuing to build this company at a time when uh, there's arguably some competition, right, from the traditional finance world. These legacy institutions coming in, they're offering an ETF version of Bitcoin. Does that make things uh, a little bit more challenging? Because I, I would think that maybe the average person, maybe a retail investor would think, well, I'm just going to go the easy route. I'm going to click buy on one of the ETFs that's in my brokerage account as opposed to going to a new company to buy spot Bitcoin. Not at all, actually. So what we found is uh, the launch of the ETF has amplified our business. Huh. And before that happened, I was actually doing research because I wasn't sure which way it would go, uh, you know, because it's kind of logical to say, well, if people can just buy Bitcoin in an ETF, why would they open an account at River? However, in my research, what I found was there was a, an example in history where something like this had happened before, and this was gold ETFs. And um, in the early 2000s, uh, gold ETFs launched. And what happened was that when the gold ETFs launched, uh, the ownership of physical gold 
in the United States buying gold bars and coins for your house actually increased. So basically what an ETF seems to do is bring attention to a certain asset class, uh, which really lifts, rises every boat. Oh, wow. I See, I like would have expected the opposite. I thought that it would actually make more of the, the Bitcoin focus or the crypto companies maybe lose some of their customers because now all of a sudden, you know, mom and dad can just click buy in their um, Schwab account or something. Uh, that's But that's really good. Talk to us about the interest product that you're um, launching. This is brand new. And I feel like this is taking me back to the last bull run where people were offering like yield on the actual coins and that blew up in their faces. But this is different. This is more like your savings account that you earn interest on at your bank. Yes, this is completely different. This is not a Bitcoin yield product like FTX. Your Bitcoin at River is always held one to one and we're never doing any funny business with it. This product um, is meant to solve a problem with your savings account. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the problem that a lot of our clients have and a lot of Bitcoiners have is that while they predominantly save in Bitcoin, most people, even big Bitcoin believers, have cash savings, especially if you have a family, uh, you have rent, you need to make sure that you have a predictable cash buffer to cover your expenses for the months ahead. And mm -hmm. the issue is, even if you have that cash in a high yield savings account, you're still losing to inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, food prices are going up, tuition's going up, uh, housing prices and rent is going up, and your savings account isn't keeping up with that. And so we asked the question, how could we solve this problem for our clients? And w the solution was Bitcoin interest on cash. And that's what, we're, that's what we've launched is the ability to now all cash on River will earn a high yield interest rate, 3.8%. Mm -hmm but paid out in Bitcoin. And the reason this is important is that if you, if you look at the historical performance of Bitcoin, if you had been earning this, uh, your interest paid out in Bitcoin over the last few years, your effective interest rate would have been in the teens, hmm. uh, which would have strongly outpaced inflation. So we're giving our clients the predictability that they need with cash savings, but the upside in Bitcoin. And so you're getting the best of both worlds. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. And it incentivizes you to basically create this fiat account that you can also take from then and then buy more Bitcoin, right? So you're, it's sitting there earning Bitcoin and then you could use it to dollar cost average. Exactly. That's the cool thing. We already support holding cash on river, but to date we haven't been actually, we haven't been allowed to pay out interest with this product. What we've yeah. done is all the hard work behind the scenes with a banking partner to oh. allow to be able to actually pay out interest. Behind the scenes, it's actually a bank account. And um, wow. it's, it's, it's a bank account and uh, the cash is FDIC insured up to $250,000. It's, it's mm. managed very conservatively at the bank, held mostly at the Fed um, or in the cash sweep accounts. And um, oh, so wow. that's the hard, the hard work behind this. Yeah, so there's a real bank account there uh, for for the, the customer. And okay, well, this is, go ahead. I was going to say the other cool thing is, yeah, you can use that cash to buy Bitcoin, just like you always could at River. But now, uh, even if that cash is there set, waiting in like a limit order, a target price order, we call it, it's still earning interest. So wow. any type of cash you have at River, maybe it's cash waiting to dollar cost average, maybe it's cash for a target price order, even that cash is still earning interest. Oh, that's like pretty brilliant. Because it's, cause sometimes I feel like even I've been in this position where if you do decide to create a limit order, right, that cash gets moved immediately. So you can't use it anymore. But here it's like it's sitting and it's earning interest. So that incentivizes you to do it. Wow. Well, it makes me think of, um, I mean, Bitcoin is, I think, going to assimilate more and more with the traditional, the legacy system. And I know that there are a lot of challenges when it comes to the regulatory front, just to operate a company like this, the the SAB 121, hopefully that's going to be repealed. But I think that there are still concerns about the future, who's coming into office, whether they'll make it easier or harder for the industry. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, where are the areas where um, there needs to be maybe a loosening of a regulatory stronghold or some areas that you think there needs to be more regulation maybe? What, do you, what are you thinking? Yeah, the, the biggest issue today can be summarized as that the, gov the federal government has scared banks from serving Bitcoin businesses. Right. So 
it's not that there's a specific law on the books that um, that is harming Bitcoin companies very heavily today. The biggest challenge that Bitcoin companies face is it's very difficult to get bank accounts. And uh, for example, no Bitcoin company in the United States can get a bank account at any major bank, JP Morgan, Citi, Bank of America. And it's not because it's illegal. It's because the, the regulators scare them uh, away from serving us. And so just a, a shift there would be a huge unlock. So how did you find a bank that was willing to partner with you on this um, interest sparing product? So there are some great banks out there. And uh, so we're, we're lucky that we have a great relationship with a banking partner that's run by people who understand our industry uh, and have great relationships with the regulators and can explain everything. A lot of the issue is really sometimes the bank, they just don't have the knowledge to explain to regulators what's going on. And so they just yeah. kind of go like, well, we're not going to touch it. Our banking partner is very high quality and um, luckily is run by people who really get it. And so, uh, you know, we're very grateful for that. Got it. Okay. Well, we're only a couple of weeks away from the election. So I have to ask, um, does a company like River worry about who's going to be in office and whether they might be more favorable to the industry versus maybe push more, um, I don't know, strict rules or something like Operation Choke Point? That was an extreme, but hopefully we won't see that again. Um, absolutely. Now, I will say that the the Bitcoin and crypto Bitcoin and crypto as a political force has grown substantially, which hopefully, regardless of who becomes president, helps keep things a little bit in check. It is a very big voting, voting block. It is a very big donor base at this point. And so um, that's, you know, that's hopefully, regardless of who wins, going to be our saving grace. That said, I do think that that history is pretty clear. Um, the Biden administration has not been friendly to Bitcoin and crypto, and I don't think that there's any... Uh, I think it'd be kind of silly to expect that to change with a Harris presidency. I think a Trump presidency would be uh, way easier on our industry from a regulatory perspective. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. First up, Casa. It is so easy to set up your Bitcoin three key self custody with Casa that I can show you pretty much the whole process in just 30 seconds. You're watching it right now. I recently switched to Casa for multi-sig collaborative custody and inheritance planning because of their enhanced non-KYC required privacy and the ease of this mobile app. Make sure to watch the tutorials and get your Casa plan for 10% off at casa.io slash Natalie. Next up, Speed Lightning Wallet, one of the fastest growing Bitcoin wallets out there. Speed is a secure, low-cost way to send and receive Bitcoin and stable coins instantly. The app is super simple to use and customers love it. Download Speed using the QR code on the screen or the link in my show notes. Use promo code COINSTORIES10 to get 5,000 free sats. Next up, CoinKite. You know how much I believe in self-custody, and when it comes to cold storage wallets, none are better than the cold card. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. And finally, are you ready to take control of your wealth? The Bitcoin way is here to empower you. Learn how to take full self-custody and eliminate all counterparty risk. Set up your node and become the master of your own transactions and enjoy true autonomy. And upgrade your cybersecurity and protect your online privacy like I did. The Bitcoin Way specializes in personalized one-on-one -on -one training to help you become fully self-sovereign. Schedule a free consultation today. Yeah, I mean, my hope is in the long run, it's, you know, I'm bullish on adoption and general growing and that both sides of the political forces will will embrace this. But in the near term, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, let's just zoom out and talk about Bitcoin in general, because your background, again, it's very technical and you studied computer science. You taught that for the first course at Stanford on Bitcoin. Can you talk about that your first journey and maybe why you decided to dedicate essentially your, your life to building in this space and why you think Bitcoin is so special. So I came across Bitcoin in 2013 after I graduated college and it immediately clicked for me. And the reason wasn't because I was technical. The reason was actually because I had spent a lot of time in college reading economics books. And I had gotten really interested in the concept of money. What is money? Uh, why is money controlled by 
a central bank and why can the government arbitrarily print money? And so I was super fascinated by those ideas. And I was trying to come up with, I, I, I wanted to create my own money that the government couldn't control backed by commodities. And oh, wow. I couldn't really figure out how to do that without getting in trouble or, uh, uh, or, and, and, or what a business model would be. And then I came across Bitcoin and it immediately clicked. An economist named Friedrich Hayek had predicted that some new type of money would appear through some sly roundabout way. And I wasn't smart enough to come up with the sly roundabout way, but I was able to recognize it. And when I did, I immediately knew that this was going to be the future and that I had to work on it. Oh, that's really cool. I wish I was earlier and I, I wish I had studied economics in school, but I didn't. I was a I was an ignorant journalist, although I knew something was wrong in the system, which I feel like most of my audience too, no matter what industry you're in, what your background is, and Preston says this a lot, it's like something's wrong. I know there's something wrong. They just they don't know what it is and they point the finger at all the symptoms as opposed to addressing the root cause. Um, you guys do a lot of educational work. You've put out some great videos. I've used actually in some of my presentations your uh, graphic about the Cantillon effect and why people who are closer to the money printer benefit. But can you talk about maybe just education in general, where we're at? I feel like there was this just boom of attention and awareness and interest during the last bull market, 2021-ish. And and it, and there's a lull, at least I'm experiencing it. I'm in the Midwest. I know you're you're in the Big Apple um, and in and San Francisco, you're on the coast, the big cities. But here I go around and no one's really interested in Bitcoin right now. And and I don't know why. It feels like some of that curiosity has gone away and maybe it'll return when the price goes running again. W what are you seeing? Um, directionally, similar things. However, that said, I would say the um, that we saw a huge spike in the beginning in, in the beginning of the of the year in interest uh, in interest around Bitcoin when the mm -hmm. ETF launched. Yeah, and that's stayed high in a sustained way, but it has fallen off a little bit over the summer. I think it's a mix of there's typically a summer lull. People go on vacation; they have other things they're worried about, and the price has been relatively flat. I think retail always comes back when prices move and that's just the way it's going to be for a while. And eventually people, Bitcoin will just become such a normal part of people's lives that yeah, it'll just, you know, be there. And I don't even know how many people at the end of the day will deeply think about Bitcoin, even in a hyper Bitcoinized world. Really? So are you very bullish? Like, are you feeling like this is this is the future. This is going to eat into all these different asset classes. This will be the way that you can generate wealth and build generational wealth for your family. Uh, yes. So I, the, what I think is happening right now is that Bitcoin is continuing to grow on its trajectory to become the world reserve asset. Mm. However, the U.S. dollar is still quite a ways away from losing its status as the world reserve currency. And specifically mm -hmm. what I mean here is I think over the next decade, what we're gonna see play out is that more and more people save in Bitcoin because they realize that saving in dollars doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin will continue to soak, suck up that wealth and continue to appreciate substantially. However, from a day-to-day -day payments perspective, the dollar will still be the, the currency. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's how I, would, how I would distinguish it. You know, we had a we had a period historically where gold was the world reserve asset mm -hmm. for millennia. The last fifty years, it was the U.S. dollar, and then and it's changing to Bitcoin. That's what is I there, think. Is there anything that worries you about Bitcoin? Do you think about any black swans, or could there be a really draconian? Um, kind of government response if Bitcoin gets very popular? Like, what do you, are there any concerns that you have when you think about the future of Bitcoin? I always, I'm always paranoid. And I think everyone in this industry <laughs> is always paranoid. And I think it's important to stay that way. And so, yes, uh, we should always be paranoid about making sure that the Bitcoin core code doesn't have bugs in it. Uh, yeah. We should always be paranoid about attacks we could see Right, either regulatory or from governments. Um, that said, mm -hmm. I think that Bitcoin's momentum and success is much more likely, or its success is much more likely than it was 
just five years ago. I think the BlackRock mm -hmm. ETF has elevated Bitcoin to being getting the institutional stamp of approval. And now that that's happened, it's going to be a lot harder to kill. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I don't know why, but I tend to just have... I don't know, bearish leanings from my background of something's all, something always blows up, especially for our generation. Um, so when you look out into the future, what is your vision for building in the space? Because I've had guests on, on the, on the macro side who predict this massive consolidation of the big banks into fewer and fewer. And we've, we've been seeing that, right? So we're going to end up with maybe just a few. Um, so if you're competing eventually, when like a Chase Bank can custody Bitcoin and offer people Bitcoin, how does a company like River compete with that? What's like the vision? It's a good question. And I don't have perfect answers yet. But what I do know is if you look at the trend of technology and you look at uh, and you look at companies that have started from nothing and become successful against big incumbents, there's always some wedge that a small, nimble, focused team is able to exploit mm -hmm. to sort of outdo the big incumbent guys that just can't move fast enough. So even if you had a law tomorrow that were that um, allowed Chase to offer Bitcoin in the app, it just wouldn't it just wouldn't be the same. Um, it like they wouldn't do it. It, it wouldn't be elevated to a pro predominant position. Uh, the internal culture there is so conservative and anti Bitcoin that. I think it's it's almost certain that they wouldn't do that until there was some company like River growing so fast that they realized they had no other choice. But by that mm -hmm. point, it may it may be too late for them. Do you get a lot of information on the the retail customers that have accounts in terms of just demographics? Like, are you seeing certain age groups, um, men versus women, uh, when they're buying? Like, is there total FOMO when the market runs up? Are a lot of people dollar cost averaging? Like, Talk to us about your customers. Yeah. So our, our client base is very diverse. They have one thing in common though, which is a, a common theme that we've discovered recently was that pretty much every River client takes ownership over their lives. That's the one thing that everyone has in common. And in terms of demographic breakdown, uh, it definitely skews male. It's probably, I would say 80% uh, male, 20% female, which frankly is for Bitcoin is pretty good. And yeah. we're seeing those female numbers continue yeah. to grow, uh, which is, which is great from an age perspective. It's, it's decently evenly distributed across the board, um, twenties, thirties, forties, but we have clients, we have clients in their nineties. Uh, and so people of every age group is interested in Bitcoin. Now we, we really predominantly serve the U S mostly. And so, uh, I don't know what those trends look like in other countries, but um, our clients also tend to be a bit more uh, compared to maybe some other apps. They're a bit up market. Um, you know, the, the average client has like a, a, a steady career. Uh, they're yeah. really driven and ambitious. Yeah. So you probably see like, you know, account balances that range from a couple sats to a lot of Bitcoin or do people take it off the exchange? No, actually, most people keep their Bitcoin on River. Um, we make it Seriously? super easy. Oh, yeah, wow. like the vast majority. Um, wow. We we by no means tell them they should. Uh, we very much encourage self-custody. We have an auto withdraw feature that allows you to, whenever your balance hits a certain point, sweeps it to your cold storage. But uh, I think a lot of people just want the ease of trusting somebody. And so we take that responsibility very seriously, uh, which is why we built proof of reserves and take, you know, take security. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we work a lot on security stuff. Yeah, no, no, you do. And that's why, like, I was always impressed with you as a, um, as a leader, as a CEO, because you have that background and it was really about making sure to build up that back end. Um, what, what do you want people to focus on that maybe they're not paying as much attention to, or something that you think needs to be highlighted in the space more? That's a good question. Um, I feel like literally, I mean, I've mentioned this on the show before, but I feel like we're in this holding period. 
like we're waiting for something. I don't know if you feel this way, but I just, I don't know if it's because the election's coming up and then finally we'll have some sort of outcome or, you know, we're waiting for the six figure Bitcoin or we're waiting for X, Y, Z. I just feel like we're in that in between phase and it's a little bit of a limbo. Absolutely. It's, uh, it, we're in a bit of a doldrum. That said, I think that it's important to, for people to craft their vision for the future. Um, that I think that it's important for everyone to be optimistic and believe the future will be better than today and that Bitcoin will enable that. Um, and also, I think there's a lot of people who sit around and look at Bitcoin as their hope, which is great, but, but actually, um, you know, Bitcoin is going to be an amplifying force for people's lives, but it can't be the primary driver of everyone's life. You still need to f develop your own skills and that doesn't have to be in Bitcoin. Um, you still need to develop your own skills and maybe build your own business in a different industry, uh, stack Bitcoin on your balance sheet, but do something else to improve the future and, and drive humanity forward. Uh, and so I think a lot of people who are interested in Bitcoin think I have to work in Bitcoin. Actually, no, you don't. Do something else really, really well and bring Bitcoin into that industry. I love that. You mean we don't need more Bitcoin podcasts? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Alex, this has been really great. Any final thoughts or messages before we share with everyone how to find you and your company? And I'll put a link in the show notes, of course, as well. I'd say stay humble and stack sets. <laughs> clean and simple. I like it. Well, I hope uh, everyone checks out River. I am not sponsored by the company, but I do have an affiliate link. So if you want some free Bitcoin, sign up. Uh, there's going to be a link in the show notes. Alex, it's been great to just get to know you through the space. I've had the chance to have dinner with you and just get to know you in person, which is awesome. I wish all of us lived closer together. Um, but thank you so much. And I am a happy customer. So I hope everyone checks out River. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. This show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open. If you want to share feedback or guest suggestions, just reach out at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Make sure you're subscribed to the show and check out my free newsletter, nataliebrunel.substack.com. I'll see you next time.